Greetings, friends. Welcome back to the broadcast. I'm Sean. Website can be found at scriptureandprophecy.com. That's where you go to find the archives, and that's where you go to support this mission of truth. Well, this morning I thought we would look at this week's prophets portion, which happens to be Zechariah, starting with chapter 2, verse 10, and ending with chapter 4, verse 7. Um, All of this is fairly short, but we're going to read all of chapter 4. And uh, Zechariah has a vision uh, that's very similar to a vision that John, the Apostle John, had when he was on the island of Patmos and he wrote the book Revelation. And there's two specific, or there's something specific that's spoken about that I just think is very interesting. So we're going to be taking a look at that this morning. Just a quick recap for those of you who might be new. What is the weekly tour portion? Uh, You can go to my website and type that into the little uh, search box and you will get uh, a blog post entitled, What is the weekly tour portion or weekly prophets portion? Here's what it is real quickly. The weekly prophets portion or in Hebrew, the Haftorah, which means parting or taking leave is a scheduled reading from the biblical books of the prophets which follow along with the weekly Torah reading schedule. The Torah portion schedule has been followed by synagogues around the world since the Babylonian captivity, and maybe even longer, and some should suggest that the tradition was started by the scribe Ezra. It is unknown why the tradition of the weekly prophets portion was instituted, but many believe the Haftorah was a response to Jewish persecution in which the weekly Torah readings were forbidden. So, that is what it is. In fact, we see Jesus, he goes into, if you read the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, he goes into a, a synagogue, and it says, As it was on the custom, he went there on the Sabbath day and stood up for reading, and he read from the book of Isaiah. So that is what it is, and uh, so that's what we're following today. All right, enough of all of that. Let's get to it. So it starts with chapter 2, verse 10, and uh, open up your hearts, and let's see what the Word of God has to say to us this morning. Verse 10, chapter 2. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion. For lo, I come and I will dwell in the midst of thee, saith the Lord. And many nations shall be joined in the Lord in that day, and shall be my people. And I will dwell in the midst of thee, and thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts has sent me unto thee. And the Lord shall inherit Judah, his portion, in the holy land, and shall choose Jerusalem again. Be silent. O all flesh, before the Lord, for he is raised up out of his holy habitation. Please note, what you're going to discover is that this uh, talks a lot about, and it has little nuances and, and symbolisms and things that point to Messiah. Even here, it talks about how God is going to come and dwell with us, right? tabernacle with us now chapter 3 starts and he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him so please note again chapter 3 starts with this vision of Joshua now it's talking about Joshua the one that you read about in the Old Testament but it's also a play on words that I think is very, very interesting. Joshua's name was actually Yahushua in Hebrew. And of course, the short form of that is Yeshua. Kind of like if my name was Jonathan and you called me John. Yeshua or Yahushua, which is also the name given to our Lord, right? That was the Hebrew name he received, which means Jehovah saves. So we have Yahushua, the high priest. That is just, to me, when I read that, that just jumps out. Um, Even though the vision is clearly about 
Joshua, as we'll see, because he's standing before the Lord. He has Satan on his right hand trying to resist him. Um, I just don't think that that is without accident. And we'll have some other things that come up along the way as well. Let's continue on. Let's just start over verse 1, chapter 3. And he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the five? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. And he answered and he spake to those and stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thy iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with a change of raiment. And I said, Let them set a fair mitre upon his head. So they set a fair mitre upon his head, and clothed him with the garments. And the angel of the Lord stood by. And the angel of the Lord protested unto Joshua, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, If thou wilt walk in my ways, and if thou wilt keep my charge, then thou shalt also judge my house, and shalt keep my courts, and I will give thee places to walk among these that stand by. Hear now, O Joshua the high priest, thou and thy, fo- thy, and thy fellows that sit before thee, For they are men wondered at for. Behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. So please note, obviously the the branch is talking about our Savior. And it's it's interesting. And the King James Bible will uh, put that word, the branch, in all caps for you. And there's multiple places where he is referred to as the branch. Uh, For example, in Jeremiah chapter 23, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch. And a king shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. Jeremiah again, chapter 33 says, In those days at that time I will cause the branch of righteousness to grow up unto David, and he shall execute judgment and righteousness in the land. Isaiah, for he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as the root out of a dry ground, and he hath no form nor comeliness. When ye shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Talking about Messiah, Isaiah says in chapter 11, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow up out of his roots. Isaiah says again in chapter 4, In that day shall the branch of the Lord be a beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and calmly for them that are escaped of Israel. There's more examples even. Uh, Ezekiel brings it up. So, he is known as the branch. And that's part of the prophecy. And we're getting ready to get into something that you will f- find familiar if you're familiar with the book of Revelation. Let's continue on. Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant the branch. For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua, upon one stone shall be seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave the graving thereof, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. And that day, saith the Lord of hosts, shall you call every man his neighbor under the vine and under the fig tree. Chapter 4 And the angel that talked with me came again and walked with me as a man that is wakened out of his sleep. And he said unto me, What seest thou? And I said, I have looked, and behold, a candlestick of all gold, with a bowl upon the top of it, and his seven lamps thereon, and seven pipes to the seven lamps, which are upon the top thereof, and two olive trees by it, 
one upon the right side of the bowl and the other upon the left side thereof. So I answered and spake unto the angel that talked with me, saying, What are these, my lord? Then the angel that talked with me answered and said unto me, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my lord. Then he answered and he spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord. Unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Who art thou, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? Thou shalt become a plain, and shalt bring forth the headstone thereof, with shoutings, crying, Grace, grace unto it. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also finish it. And thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts has sent me unto you. For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. They are the eyes of the Lord which run to and fro through the whole earth. Then I answered and I said unto him, What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof? And I answered again and said unto him, What be these two olive branches, which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? And he answered me and he said, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my lord. Then he said, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. So that is how chapter 4 ends. Now you probably heard something that's very familiar. He has a vision of the candlesticks and of the two olive trees. Same vision that John has. And what does the angel say to Zechariah? He says, these are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. I found it interesting that Zechariah sees them emptying themselves of oil. Now remember, when we're talking about prophecy, in many, t in many cases, it's very symbolic. But the Bible will let you know when it's symbolism and when it's not. It's very clear from the context that these two olive trees are symbolic for something else. That's why Zechariah is asking what it represents. And the angel says, it's the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. So let's go to John's revelation which we see in chapter 11. Here's what it says. Then there was given to me a measuring rod like a staff, and someone said, Get up and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship it. Leave out the courtyard which is outside the temple and do not measure it, because it has been given to the nations, and they will trample the holy city for 42 months. And I will grant authority to my two witnesses... And they will prophesy for 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire flows out of their mouth and devours their enemies. And so if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this way. These have the power to shut up the sky so that rain will not fall during the days of their prophesying. And they have power over waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every plague as often as they desire. And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up out of the abyss will make war with them and overcome them and kill them. And their bodies will lie on the streets of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where their Lord was crucified. Those from the people, tribes, languages, and nations will look at their dead bodies for three and a half days and will not allow their dead bodies to be laid in a tomb. And those who live on the earth will rejoice over them and celebrate. And they will send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who live on the earth. And after the three days, three and a half days, the breath of life from God came into them and they stood on their feet and a great fear fell upon those who were watching them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up here. And they went up into heaven in a cloud and the enemies watched them. 
and at that time there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. Seven thousand people were killed in the earthquake, and the rest, the rest were terrified and gave glory to God in heaven. So, again, John sees the same people, and he's told that they are messengers, two prophets apparently, Interesting views about this. Um, there are those who think that uh, it represents um, maybe like uh, Israel, uh, specifically the Jews of Israel and the Gentile church. Um, some think it uh, represents uh, Moses and Elijah. They'll be the two prophets uh, standing in, which it tells us where this is at. This is in, this is in Israel. Uh, in Jerusalem. And then uh, if you go back and you look at some of the early church fathers, for example, if you go look up uh, Hippolytus, who was an apostle of Irenaeus, who was an apostle of Polycarp, who was an apostle of the apostle John, so not too far removed. He believed, according to things that he wrote, uh, that it was Enoch and Elijah. And one of his arguments was simply that uh, neither one of those have died. They were both taken up, right? They were both raptured, so to speak, and that they will reappear in the last days as the prophets who uh, caused the world some trouble. Anyone who tries to kill them is killed until the beast overcomes them and kills them in their the world celebrates, sends gifts to one another, makes their bodies just lie in the streets. But then three days later, they are risen from the dead in the eyes of the people, which causes a great dread to fall upon the whole earth. And then there's a great earthquake. And that is the second woe that we read about in the book of Revelation. Interesting stuff. There's a lot to still be studied just in those little few verses that we read out of Zechariah. And I recommend that you take the time to do so. Unfortunately, I am out of time this morning. Uh, but I just pray that you enjoyed this study. And again, a lot. there's a lot there to unpack and to look at and to examine. Uh, but hopefully I managed to hit a few major points for you that stir something within you. Maybe stir some curiosity within you to uh, s search these prophecies even deeper. Well, that's all I have for you this morning. Thank you for praying for me and my family. Thank you for those of you who support this mission of truth. Peace and grace be with all of you. And until next time, God bless.